So he gets inaugurated and calls me up and says he's having a group of business people to come to the White House and would I be willing to come up next Tuesday? And I thought, wow, you kidding? I'm a little guy from North Carolina. I've never been to the White House. I'd love to come. But after that meeting, he asked me if I would come down to the Oval Office. And I thought, oh, wow, this is great. And I went down to the Oval Office with him and he walked over to his desk and took out a pen and signed something. And then he came over to me and handed me the pen and he said, Erskine, this is a pen I use to lift the executive order on stem cell research. He said, I want you to take this pen home and give it to your son, Sam, and to tell him today he has hope. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Erskine Bowles. Erskine has led a distinguished career in both the private and public sector. He began his business career at Morgan Stanley and went on to found Bowles Hall Connor, which became the preeminent investment bank focused on middle market mergers and acquisitions. In 1993, Erskine went to the White House to serve as President Clinton's Deputy Chief of Staff and later as Chief of Staff, where he negotiated the first balanced budget in a generation. From 2005 to 2011, he served as President of the University of North Carolina. And since 2017, I've had the great pleasure of co-chairing with Erskine the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, a bipartisan group of distinguished leaders and thinkers with the goal of promoting evidence-based solutions to significant U.S. economic challenges. Erskine, welcome to the podcast. You've done it all, excelled in the private sector, in government, higher education, and as a philanthropist. So I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Let's start in North Carolina. You're a proud son of your home state having been born and raised in Greensboro and now living in Charlotte. Talk a bit about your upbringing there, how it shaped you. Where did your interest in finance and public service come from? Well, first of all, Hank, I'm happy to be with you. There are a few people I admire to the extent I do you, so I'm thrilled to have a chance to spend uh, a half hour or so with you. You're right. uh, Like this old song goes, I'm a Tar Heel born and a Tar Heel bred, and when I die, I'll be a Tar Heel dead. In my career, I think it's fair to say I've had a chance to live and work all over the world, but I always found myself coming back home to North Carolina. It's where my family's always been, it's where my kids are, and it's a great place to live and work and raise your family. So North Carolina is home for me. Now, how did I get my interest in finance and public service? They both came from the same man, from my dad. When I was a kid, I used to follow my dad around when he went to work. And what my dad did is he would start a small business, build it into a medium-sized business, and then he'd either sell it to his partners or take it public or sell it to a larger corporation. And what I liked about what he did was the transaction itself. And as I grew up, uh, I learned that people who did these transactions were called investment bankers. And so when I got out of the military, I knew I wanted to go to Columbia to business school because it was in New York and that's where these investment bankers were supposed to be. And secondly, right after I got out of Columbia, I had a chance to go work for Morgan Stanley and fulfill my lifelong dream of having a chance to become one of these people who did these transactions called investment bankers. You and I both got there. (laughs) (laughs) At about the same time. In in different ways. I had no idea what an investment banker was when I was in high school or I was in college. So to me, it was a serendipitous route. But that brings me to your next question. My next question. I've always believed that what your dad did, founding and building a successful company is one of the toughest most rewarding jobs there is, and it makes a lasting contribution to society. Business is really a noble occupation, and being able to start one, it, is, it takes a knack. Yeah. What led you to found 
Bowles, Hall, and Connor. What lessons did you learn which could be passed yeah. on to aspiring entrepreneurs? Hank, when, when I was at Morgan Stanley in the late 60s and early 70s, I would see small companies, either divisions of large companies or small companies that were privately held. I'd see them go to Wall Street looking for a marriage partner to be sold. And generally, when they went to the larger investment banking firms, they got assigned to pretty junior inexperienced people. And therefore, the transactions got structured poorly and packaged poorly and marketed poorly. It wasn't the case of the expertise not being there. It just wasn't applied to those size deals because it takes as much time as you know to do a, a 30 or 40 or $50 million deal as it does a $500 million deal. And obviously, the compensation is really differently. And when they went to the, what were then called commercial banks or to, you know, small brokerage companies out in the, the country, you know, if you did one deal a year there, you were a hero. If you did two, you're like the biggest star we ever had. Whereas a place like Goldman or Morgan, you know, each one of them is doing maybe 20 deals a year. And just like any other business, the more you do, the better you get at it. And so I felt there was a void in the marketplace. And I felt if I could assemble a group of people that had a high degree of experience and expertise in areas like law, accounting, taxation, and corporate finance, that maybe I could build a firm that could fill that void. And boy, was I wrong. In my first year, Hank, my revenues, not my profits, were $5,000. And in my second year, they were $30,000. And, you know, I thought the world, you know, I'd been this big star at Morgan Stanley, and I thought, the world was going to be the path to my door. And I didn't realize, you know, what a big effect that halo effect of Morgan Stanley had on people wanting to use you to do the most important transactions of their lives. But my theory was that if I just did a great job on the first deal we took, if I did what I said I would do, when I said I would get it done, and I didn't overpromise, that getting that second deal would be really easier, much easier, and the third deal even easier. And, you know, I lost money for the first three years I was in business, but lucky I'd saved a lot of money from Morgan Stanley. And by the fourth year, we really caught on and our business grew exponentially. And we ended up building the, our team did, the largest company in the country focused on middle market M&A. Yep, I tell you, that's a great story and perseverance. And I sort of cross paths with that. Because at Goldman Sachs, one of the things we learned is you didn't want to take on a small deal if you couldn't do a great job on it. And I remember when friends at Kellogg Company in Battle Creek, Michigan came and say, hey, would you sell the Battle Creek Gas Company or the utility there? Yeah. And we went to your company and they did a great job and they loved Goldman Sachs for recommending you. Our relationship with Goldman was you know, was the best thing that ever happened to us. You know, you're exactly right. Over and over, over again, people like Jeff Wazi and Mike Overlock and Ken Brody, you know, really took a, a chance on us. And they saw that we did the same kind of job on those small deals that they would have done on a materially larger deal. And that we didn't overpromise. We did what we said we would do. And it was made more sense for them to recommend us to do the smaller deals and they knew we'd never be a you know, threat to get the larger deals. And therefore, they'd keep somebody like Morgan Stanley from swooping in to get that large business by doing the small deal. So it worked out great for both of us. It sure did. A symbiotic relationship. Now, you know, so we've talked about where you got the interest in finance, right, from your daddy. Yep. But you've had a big career in government and philanthropy. So I'm going to talk about government. So where did that interest come from? How did you come to be the chief of staff? How did you get to know Bill Clinton? And I want to hear what it was like working with him up close and personal. Oh, wow. Uh, first of all, you know, I became chief of staff out of a whole series of flukes. We have to go back to that Goldman Sachs relationship. One day, uh, Ken Brody, who was one of your partners, called me up and he said they had a deal they wanted us to take on. And would I come up and meet with him? And I did. And when I met with Ken, you know, we had a terrific meeting. He gave us this transaction to do and we were thrilled. I mean, it was a great deal. And at the end of the meeting, Ken said, could you stay a minute? And I said, sure. And he said, Erskine, haven't you been involved in 
democratic politics in North Carolina. And I said, Ken, I, I used to be, but you know, I really don't have time to now because I'm so involved in building this business. And I'm also serving as the international president of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation because my two sons both have type one juvenile diabetes. And he said, well, look, you know, uh, lots of us here are really are big fans of the uh, governor of Arkansas. And, you know, he's trying to build a team in the South. And would you be willing to meet with him? And if you'd like him, have a fundraiser for him. And I thought, oh, God, that's the last thing in the world I want to do. I said, isn't that the guy who made that long speech at the Democratic Convention a couple of years ago? And he said, yeah. But I figured since, you know, Ken had been, become such a good friend that I would take it on. And, you know, I'd been hanging around politicians most of my life and never been impressed with any of them. I never met one I would actually hire. But when I met Bill Clinton, I was really knocked over. Here was a guy who was fiscally responsible, socially progressive, and had more personal magnetism than anybody I'd ever met in my life. And I thought, wow. But I thought after the, you know, the fundraiser we had, that it was kind of like over. But from time to time, he would call me as he was traveling places in the South and ask me if I would go ride with him. And when I did, he just asked me question after question after question about business. But, you know, he'd never been involved in business. And he really wanted to understand what was going on with small business because he believed that small business was the economic engine that would drive the train for the economic recovery that he wanted to bring about. Well, one of the days that I was supposed to go ride with him, my son Sam had a low blood sugar seizure from his diabetes. And Hank, if you've ever seen anything like that, it just rips your heart out. And uh, after he got well, uh, I did go meet the governor. And when we were two, just the two of us were sitting in his car, and he looked at me and he said, uh, Erskine, you look kind of blue today. And I said, well, I am governor. And he said, why? And I told him about Sam having that low blood sugar seizure, you know, and how much I loved him. And I said, what makes me doubly mad is a scientist at the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation tell me that, that stem cell research is the greatest hope for a cure for my son, Sam, and all the other little Sams who have this disease. And the president just vetoed the stem cell research bill after it passed the Senate 88 to 10 with Neanderthals, like strong firm and voting yes, because it's completely separated from the abortion interests. And, you know, Hank, it was like I was talking to the steering wheel. He didn't, didn't respond at all. And I remember going home and telling my wife Crandall that night, you know, about it. And I said, gosh, you know, I really thought this guy was supposed to be really empathetic, but he didn't even respond. But anyway, to make a long story short, two weeks later, he made his major health care speech at Merck. And in that speech, he said, I have a friend of mine who's a conservative businessman in North Carolina, who has a son he loves more than life, who has diabetes. And I've decided that if I'm elected president, I'm going to get the politics out of scientific research and I'm going to lift the ban on stem cell research. Well, you know, the diabetes, the Parkinson's, and other autoimmune disease organizations all went crazy. They thought that was great. And somebody figured out I must be that conservative businessman in North Carolina and told me about it. But Governor Clinton never said a word to me about it. Well, after he was elected, you know, they offered me a bunch of jobs. But going to, to Washington had never been on my dream sheet of things I wanted to do. So I just didn't, you know, pay any attention to it. And so he gets inaugurated and calls me up and says he's having a group of business people to come to the White House and would I be willing to come up next Tuesday? And I thought, wow, you kidding? I'm a little guy from North Carolina. I've never been to the White House. I'd love to come. But after that meeting, he asked me if I would come down to the Oval Office. And I thought, wow, this is great. And I went down to the Oval Office with him and he walked over to his desk and took out a pen and signed something. And then he came over to me and handed me the pen. And he said, Erskine, this is a pen I use to lift the executive order on stem cell research. He said, I want you to take this pen home and give it to your son, Sam, and to tell him today he has hope, hope for a cure. Wow. That was, I mean, just 
that, so, he, that so now he me. owns you. <laughs> and that night I went home and talked to Crandall, and then I talked to my partners the next day. And I called him up. I'd take any job he had, and that's how it all started. That's how I got there. And so you came, you know, your deputy chief of staff. You ultimately became the chief of staff in the yeah. White House. And I look at that job, having been a treasury and seen it up close and personal, I, I don't think there's anything more demanding in Washington than being the White House chief of staff. Because all of the biggest issues, whether they're domestic issues, foreign policy issues, political issues, scandals, whatever, they end up on your desk before they go to the president. Talk about the job and what it's like in that pressure cooker environment. It is a pressure cooker and the burnout rate is pretty high. Let me give you an example of just of what a ordinary week would be like. Uh, you know, I would start every day about five, I'd go out and run. And when I came back, there'd be four or five papers there. I'd read them and there'd be some allegation in there claiming that the president had done one thing or another. And about half the time it was true. And after you read those and thought about it, I'd get in the, the car and ride down with the secret service down to the White House. And when I got there, I'd get a briefing from a president's daily brief on how the world had changed according to the CIA. And then you'd have a meeting with the foreign policy team, the domestic policy team, the economic policy team, and then the White House staff. And about that time, the president's tooling over from the East Wing, it's about 8.30, and you'd update him on how the world had changed since he went to bed the previous night. It was always amazing how much it had changed. And then we'd go our separate ways. And in an average day, you, in my case, you deal with things like Bosnia, Northern Ireland, the Mideast, uh, the budget, taxation, some squabble between two cabinet agencies over the environment, uh, you know, a legislative issue you were trying to get through the Congress. And then you'd have lunch. I mean, what people can't believe is the, the velocity of a place. It was faster than the dot-com world and the breadth of issues that you have to deal with. And, you know, Hank, I never believe that you judge productivity by the number of hours you work, but you can't get that job done in a normal 10-hour day. You know, I'd usually get home by 10.30 or so at night, and, you know, one out of 10 nights, you'd get a, a phone call in the middle of the night waking you up, and either you got to make the decision because it's big if it's come to you, uh, and it's gone through the various cabinet departments, and either you got to make the decision or you got to wake up the president if it's really big. And you try not to do that as often as you can, but sometimes, you know, it's something only he can make the decision. And, you know, when Friday got there, you know, we always said, thank God it's Friday, only two more work days till Monday. And if you're doing one of those during Sunday shows on Sunday, you got to spend the work time you would have spent on some policy matter getting ready for the Sunday show on Sunday. And before you know it, you're back into to Monday again. So it, it's a lot to say the least. It is. It is a grind. And I think you've largely answered this, but in a few words, what makes an effective chief of staff? And what was it that made it possible for you to reach across the aisle and work with Newt Gingrich and balance the budget? I think the number one thing that makes you an effective chief of staff is that you have the ability to speak for the president. And you can't do that unless you have earned his trust. And, you know, people don't give you their trust. You have to earn it over an extended period of time. And not having had a long relationship with the president, you know, I had to earn that trust. But once you have it, you can speak for the president, and then you have a chance to be effective. And you've also got to be prepared to speak truth to power. And as you know, gosh, people, you know, would come in to see me in the chief of staff's office and they'd say, gosh, you know, you, you got to tell the president this. And I said, no, I want you to go in the Oval Office and you tell the president because he needs to hear this from you. And they, I don't care who they were, they'd go in that Oval Office and the president would be sitting there and he'd go over there and put his hand on their knee and say, how am I doing? And they'd say, oh, just great, Mr. President, just great. <laughs> And you do, you have to be willing to speak truth to power. And I was really lucky. 
you know, President Clinton wanted to know what you thought. He didn't want you to tell him what you thought he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear what you really believed. And he didn't care if you gave it to him, bark on or bark off. He wanted your real opinion. And since he surrounded himself with people that came from different perspectives and different backgrounds, some who were more conservative like me, some who were more liberal like Bob Reich, he wanted to hear what you thought. And we could make recommendations of red, yellow, and green to that guy. And I swear to goodness, he would see orange and we'd say, wow, extraordinary. Amazing, but I think the other thing I would say, when I look at your career leading up to the White House, it was a perfect career because you were the founder, you were the CEO of your boutique investment bank, but you were used to working with clients, yeah. right? And you couldn't get a deal done unless you listened to both sides. And so you knew how to be the boss and how to work for the boss, okay? It's amazing how many people from business that don't know that if they just run a, a huge company where, you know, they say something, everybody jumps. I agree, Hank. You know, the corner of the realm for success for me has always been trust. And I did have to earn the trust of a president, but I also had to earn the trust of the White House staff. And then when I was negotiating with Gingrich, I had to earn his trust, you know, in order to get something done. And I think that one word defines what leads to somebody who can be really successful at that job or somebody who's really going to struggle from day one. And I guess that would sum it up in terms of the advice you're going to have for the next man or woman who's got that job, because uh, that's going to be a huge job right now, given where our country is. You know, Hank, one of the things that everybody who takes that job can't forget is that it's not your presidency. It's the president's presidency. <laughs> and it's your job to build an organization that can implement his priorities, again, not yours, his priorities. You gotta develop the goals, objectives, timelines, and the accountability so that you can enact the priorities he has campaigned on and been elected to perform. And you're gonna be able to enact them either through legislation or through executive order. And again, I think I was really lucky to have a guy like Bill Clinton to work for. I treasured every minute of it. There were extreme highs and extreme lows but it was an extraordinary experience to say the least. And that's just good advice for Washington overall, because so many people go there and they tend to personalize everything. Yeah. And if they get criticized, they personalize that. It's, it's so brutal there in terms of some of the things people say publicly, some of the things they say privately, but it can't be about you. It's got to be about the nation, got to be about the president, got to be about getting things done. And those that can do that, are very successful and those that can't, it catches up with them ultimately, you know. It sure does. Now, to switch a little bit, because you've had just a fascinating career. So here you are, you've, you know, you've done it in the, in the private sector, you've done it in government, and that isn't enough for you. So now you're gonna go to education. And the University of North Carolina, you know, I'd always thought of it as a, the Tar Heels. I'd like to watch the first <laughs> But let me tell you, this is huge. Is. 17 different campuses, 240,000 students. And you were the president for six years. You know, that's, oh. a, glut, that's a glutton for punishment. <laughs> not, an e not an easy job, to say the least. Here's my question. What did you learn there? And I'm sure there are a lot that carried over from Washington, right, and from business. But what do you believe is the single biggest challenge our institutions of higher learning are facing today in America? Oh, Hank, <laughs> first of all, I will tell you, you know, that I thought I understood politics when I went to the university. By the time I had been there a little while, I figured out that I got my bachelor's degree in politics in Raleigh. I got my master's in Washington, D.C., but I got my Ph.D. in politics at Chapel Hill. It is the most political organization you have ever been around and you know you've got all the business guys and really conservative people who are your trustees and you got an ultra liberal faculty and trying to move that organization forward is an enormous challenge but the biggest challenge answer your question the biggest challenge is 
I think that most universities today are functioning as really a 13th century institution trying to function in a 21st century world. I have never been involved with any organization that is more reluctant to change than a university is. And I think the one good thing that I know for sure has come out of this pandemic is the fact that it has forced these universities to a change, to adapt to new technology and to embrace that technology. Universities have been desperate for years to figure out how they're going to be able to get more throughput through their current buildings, you know, because they just can't afford to keep building, building after building after building, and how they're going to be able to hold the cost of higher education down for the students, and to figure out how they're going to be able to pay their faculty uh, higher compensation so that they can get the best and brightest. And I think the pandemic showed them how by using virtual technology, AR, AI, that they can provide this education and they can control the quality through virtual education. And I think that is the biggest change, I believe, that higher education is going to have to face up to is adapting that technology and maintaining the quality of the education while doing so. That is well said. And as you know, a lot easier said than done. So these jobs, these presidents, you know, taking on these jobs at universities are really important. Now I'm going to go to something that where you were all over the news in 2010 and something that I was really focused on, which is balancing the budget. So President Obama asked you to co-chair with former Senator Alan Simpson, and he asked you to co-chair this National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. I remember reading about it and looking at that commission and going from people on the, the left to the right and to this, this group you had. And I remember thinking, wow, why is Erskine doing this? I mean, this, <laughs> this, this looks like something. Everybody that, else said no. <laughs> it looks like a suicide mission. But you developed with that group, which I didn't think was going to be possible. You developed a clear-eyed, I think, eminently reasonable plan for reducing the deficit. And when you came forward with that, I was hopeful for a, for a nanosecond there, you know, but the politics in Washington were so fraught that it ultimately wasn't embraced. Now the federal deficit is almost twice as large as it was during the worst of the Great Recession in 2009. So anything you want to say about that commission and then looking forward, how should we be thinking about deficits and debt in 2020? Well, Hank, just to revert a second, you know, my co-chair, Al Simpson's like the, the greatest guy in the world, and he just had a stroke last week. He's out of a hospital now, and, and he's going to be fine, and I knew he was going to be fine because he told me, <laughs> told me a joke on the way home, uh, but he's, you know, he's one of the finest, best people I've ever known in my life, and I loved working with him. And one of the funniest people I've ever heard oh. Oh, I could tell you a million stories. Uh, and half of, half of them we'd have to edit out of this. <laughs> half of them, all of them you'd have to edit, edit out. But he, you know, most people didn't believe we had a snowball's chance in hell of getting anybody to vote uh, for anything that would make any sense. And, you know, we ended up getting a, a majority of Democrats, a majority of Republicans, and a super majority of a commission to vote yes. And it was what made us doubly proud is it was everybody from, you know, the, the most, we had six sitting U.S. senators. You, on had, you, had, you, had, Dick, you had Dick Durbin. And yeah, I, everybody yeah. from Dick Durbin, you know, on the far left to Tom Coburn on the far right yep. voting yes. And they did it for, you know, I think three reasons. One, we developed a common set of facts. And you, as you know, you can't get any deal done unless you got a common set of facts. And the second thing we did is we took about six months to build up trust. And again, there's that word trust. Uh, so that one side trusted that the other side was really in there to really solve a chronic long-term problem facing the country. And the third thing we did is we came together because of that trust and were able to present a plan 
that the vast majority of the people believe made good common sense. So where do I think we ought to go from here? You know, I got a, a three part answer to that, I think. First thing I think we ought to do is I think we got to think and worry about the deficit and debt a lot. It's a real long term problem. And secondly, as physically conservative as I am, this may come as a surprise to you, but I think once we thought and worried about it a lot, I think we've got to take some action to make it larger. And I'll talk about why in just a second. And thirdly, having done those first two, having worried about it, having taken steps to make it larger, the third thing we have to do is we have to develop a real, realistic, and I hope to God, bipartisan plan to bring it down when the economy stabilizes and we look at good economic news uh, in the future years. It's a real problem. Last year, we had a deficit of $3.3 trillion. That's 16% of GDP. It's the highest deficit we've had since World War II when we were paying off all the war debt. Next year, if we do nothing, it'll be 8.6% of GDP. That'll be the second and third highest level in history. The average deficit to GDP has been 3.3% or about 3%, I think, since 1945, the year I was born. So that's 75 years. And I'd like to blame it, that whole $3.3 trillion on the pandemic, but it's not true. We have a systemic problem, a built-in structural problem of about $1 trillion due to the tax cuts and the spending increases that we've made over the last decade or so. And that's going to yield about $1 trillion of deficits as far as the eye can see. So given that, why would I say we have to make it larger? First, you know, we've got some real issues coming out of the pandemic that we've got to address in order to get the economy moving again to help the small businesses and individuals who've lost their jobs and to help some of these states uh, that have just not been able to, to manage the enormous burden placed on them by the by the pandemic and the loss of revenues and the increase in healthcare costs they've had. So that's number one. Number two, we got to make it larger because some of the things we haven't done over the last seven or eight years, uh, and maybe longer. I think if America is going to compete and win in tomorrow's knowledge-based global economy, we're going to have to invest. And we're going to have to invest in education, we're going to have to invest in infrastructure and we're going to have to invest in high value added research. If we're going to compete and win in the knowledge based global economy, we're going to face. And fortunately for us, those are long term investments that we will be making, but we can finance it today with long term funds with interest rates that are lower than what the rate of growth is going to be. So we can do it in a fiscally responsible manner. So that's why I wanna make these investments for the future now. But also when times are good, this is a mistake we've made in the past, when the times are good, we do have to develop a real realistic long-term plan to reduce these deficits and put our fiscal house in order. And if we don't, the day will come that we'll pay a big, big price. Yeah, Erskine, I totally agree, totally agree. You know, to me, there's the things that you've said, getting our economy up and growing so we, so we can generate revenues, making the investments you cite, which I think have got to be made. But then we have to deal with a long-term structural deficit. And that's two things, right? That's we don't have the tax system that gives us the revenues we need. And we've got you know, entitlement programs that aren't, uh, we, we have to continue to reform them. So in any event, let's turn to something a bit more upbeat. You've done a lot with philanthropy. And I know how committed you are to helping those who are disadvantaged. You've always been focused there. So talk about 
what you're doing in North Carolina, and you've got work there in two areas, education and affordable housing. Tell us about it. Oh, I'm so happy to get a chance to do this. Uh, you know, Hank, like you, I've spent my career focused on national and global issues, and I haven't spent enough time focused on the biggest problems facing my home state. And this gives me a chance to do it in this, what is probably the final part of my career. And I am dedicating to do it. The two areas I am focused on, one are doing something about being able to make it possible for middle income kids to have a chance to go to college and graduate debt free. When I was at UNC, families would come see me. You know, they'd literally be in tears. These were families that were making maybe $60,000 a year and just an excessive amount they could make to qualify for Pell Grants or any state grants or in our case, the Great Carolina Covenant. And, you know, they tell me, you know, I can live with the fact that my life's not going to be better than my parents, but I can't live with the fact that my own kids aren't going to get a shot at the American dream. And that's a college education makes possible. And because they just couldn't afford it. And that bothered me a lot. So I did my own homework and I looked at the demographics of the university and how it had changed over the years. And you, what you could see is we had a growing number and a growing percentage of the student body coming from really needy families. And that's great. I mean, we were really proud of that because these kids could go, they could get a quality education, they could participate in extracurriculars, and they could graduate without that big burden of debt. And that was great. And that was a growing percentage. But on the other end of the barbell were kids like yours and mine who could afford to go, graduate debt-free, participate in any extracurricular, and got the great education. But what was shrinking was that middle-income student. So when I sold, when we sold the Carolina Panthers, and I, I was a minority shareholder of the Panthers, I took half the money I got from that and put it into a middle income scholarship program for kids from families making 60 to $70,000 a year. And today I've got almost 40 kids from middle income families, portion of the scholarship we set up as a work study program, but these kids can go, they can graduate debt free, they can participate in extracurricular activity, and by golly, they're gonna get a great public education. The second thing I'm working on is affordable housing. You may remember that Charlotte was selected uh, the 50th in the 50 largest cities for economic mobility. And when we trace the problem, you know, one of the five problems identified was affordable housing. And my partner, Nelson Swab and I decided we would attack that problem and take responsible responsibility for doing something about it. Today, we have a 34,000 unit shortage in affordable housing in Charlotte. And that problem is getting worse and worse because of the pandemic. You know, there are more people that don't have jobs today and more of the apartments in Charlotte are being acquired by private equity firms, fixed up a little bit. The rents are raised and these people making, you know, about 20 to $25,000 can't afford to live there anymore. So what Nelson and I did, we developed a, a financial package where we're, we are gonna be able to acquire about 1,500 uh, apartment units. These apartment units are in the center city, close to jobs, close to transportation, close to food, and close to, to good educational institutions. And we're gonna be able to, because of the way we've restricted the rents, we're gonna be able to provide the people who live in these apartments a safe, stable place to live their kids, I was out at one of the apartments the other day, you know, there were probably 200 kids in this apartment complex that we just bought. And these kids will be able to stay in the same schools they're in, you know, for their entire education. They won't have to move year to year to year as somebody comes and buys their place and raises the rent. And we're gonna be able to provide real economic opportunity, not only for the people that live there, because we're gonna provide a whole bunch of different services there. You know, Truist is one of our biggest investors. They're gonna provide financial literacy to the people that live there. The hospital is gonna provide mental and physical health. 
uh, we're going to be able to provide job opportunities uh, because we've gone out and hired all minority contractors to fix up these jobs. And so we're really going to be able to do something about this uh, lack of economic mobility. And we think uh, within the next couple of years, we'll probably be able to address at least uh, 5,000 of the 34,000 unit shortage we have in Charlotte. So Erskine, what I love about new projects, they're making a difference right there, but th these are not problems that are isolated to North Carolina. These are problems we have all over. And so these, the philanthropy you're doing, these are models that can be replicated elsewhere. And, you know, as you know, with our economic strategy group, we focused a lot on yeah. housing and rental support because there are so many incentives for those that want to buy housing. But how is that fair to all those people that should be renting, need to rent? So again, terrific work. Thank you. Now, I'd like to end on something that's positive and that's easy to do with you. Because <laughs> what I love about you is you're upbeat, you're an optimist. We can be working on the most dire problems and you're upbeat. And so, and you also spend time with young people. So what advice do you have for young people today who are looking for a job, just beginning their careers here in the midst of this pandemic, this economic crisis, what, what advice do you give them? I'd give them some advice I got from my dad. And that is, hey, don't panic. You know, you'll find a job. And when you do, you know, just do a really, really good job on that particular job. Do what you say you're gonna do, when you say you're going to get it done, don't overpromise. Always do quality. And I guarantee you, someone will notice. And when they notice and they make you an offer, don't be afraid to say yes. Don't be afraid to get out of your comfort zone and take the risk of doing something new. And when you do, like me, you're going to have some failures. But you're also going to have a chance to live a dream that's far greater than anything else you ever imagined. Opportunity is there. There are three things you got to do. One, you must do what you say you're going to do, when you say you're going to do, and not over promise. Hank, it's like when, if you tell Wendy you're going to be home at eight and you get home at 7.30, you're a hero. But if you tell Wendy you're going to be home at seven and you get home at 7.30, you're a dog. Either way, you got home at 7.30, but one way you're a hero, the other you're a dog. So if you don't overpromise and do what you say you're going to do, you know, you're going to win. And if you always do quality, you know, there's, no, you know, people say there's no substitute for quality. But I had a, a guy I was doing a transaction for in the movie business tell me one time, he said, Erskine, if you make a bad movie, the people will not come and you cannot stop them. <laughs> you know, it's kind of reverse <laughs> logic, but he got it right. If you make a bad movie, the people will not come and you cannot stop them. You have to do quality. And lastly, when you get a chance to lead and in that role, surround yourself with really good people and listen to them. And I believe if you do those things, you can't fail. I tell you, Erskine, I give very, very similar advice. I tell people all the time, it's not a perfect job, but believe me, there'll be a good job for you. And you can afford to do anything other than to not learn. So you've got to learn and you've got to do a good job. Whatever you do, you got to do it really well. And I tell you, Erskine, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. Every time I talk to you, I learn something and go back and, you know, drive those programs in North Carolina. Thank you, my friend, and thank you for all you've done for the country. You will remain one of my heroes forever. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.